...of the Gertrude Clark Whithall Foundation. We are favored tonight with the presence of Mrs. Whithall, the donor of the priceless quintet of Stradivari stringed instruments, and the sponsor of the foundation which makes these concerts possible. It is our pleasure to introduce her now to our radio audience, Mrs. Whithall. To all unseen friends who are listening in tonight, we welcome you. We are brought together by the universal bond of the love of music. This collection of instruments that you will hear played upon this week were made by the great craftsman Antonio Stradivarius. I held them in trust for a short time. Now they belong to every one of you, for they were given to our government to hold and protect forever. In presenting these instruments to the Library of Congress, it was my aim to give to the people of this country an opportunity to see and hear these rare Stradivari. They can be viewed at the Library of Congress by anyone who wishes to do so. They can be heard in concerts held in the library and also through the medium of the radio by an even larger audience. If the appreciation and enjoyment of music in America will be advanced thereby, the purpose of my gift will have been fulfilled. first plan of just having individuals play the instruments didn't work and so it was recognized very early along that the best way to have the quartets uh, of instruments played was to have a, a really practicing string quartet play them and that's when the Budapest came to the Library of Congress. I, as a matter of fact, as a young teenager in Portland, Oregon, already certain that I wanted to be a chair music player, used to listen to broadcasts of uh, the Budapest Quartet from the Library of Congress, and I thought to myself, in dreamland, that's what I'd like to do for the rest of my life. <laughs> so uh, what happened, actually, was that in the early 60s, I think 1962, uh, the Budapest had been there for about 22 years. And uh, one day the telephone rang in my apartment, and it was Harold Spivak from the music division. And he said, uh, Robert, he said, are you standing up or sitting down? And so I said, well, I'm sitting down. He said, good, because how would the Juilliard Quartet like to be the new resident quartet at the Library of Congress? <laughs> speechless for a few seconds and I said well what's happened to the Budapest he said well the Budapest first of all is playing less and we want to have a concentration on new music new repertoire and uh, we feel it's time to make a change well uh, the Juilliard Quartet was not only astonished and shocked but unbelievably happy at the idea and so that's when we became the resident quartet in the Library of Congress. Mrs. Whittall's gift of five Stradivarius instruments, three violins, a viola, and a cello, may have been inspired in part by an incident that she noted sometime shortly before her great gift. A great instrument collection had received a quartet of Stradivarius instruments with the express intention that those instruments never be used, but that they be locked up and put in a case. And it was perhaps to uh, counter this uh, 
measure that she felt she had to do something that would make sure at least four or five instruments were going to be regularly used uh, and forever if she could possibly arrange it. So this gift was made with the express intention that the instruments be played and the money that she donated to the library continues to this day to support concerts by a resident string quartet. Presently, the resident string quartet is the Juilliard String Quartet. Mrs. Coolidge was, if you see her as her contemporary saw her, probably the lady most interested in contemporary music and in new ideas. Mrs. Whitall would have seen Mrs. Coolidge as being less in the mainstream or the tradition of Western music, I think, and probably modeled herself after or saw herself as a compensating and conservative influence in this by establishing the concerts that used her Stradivarius instruments. She was obviously a person of, of intense interest in the arts. She was uh, very uh, clear about what she wanted. She was never in any doubt as to the intention of her gifts, and as long as she was here to see that they were used as they should be, it was clear that she was very much in control. Uh, she took advice from the chief of the division, but she was, never needed much coaching as to what the intention of her generosity was for. These instruments were collected for uh, Gertrude Clark Whittall by a very fine violinist by the name of Louis Krasner, who still teaches now at the New England Conservatory of Music. And it was a slow process. He didn't get all the instruments at once. They weren't a group of instruments that even belonged together. He found one instrument, the great Betts uh, violin, and she had given him permission and the budget to buy these instruments, and he got that instrument. He got the two Castle Bark instruments, got the viola, and he got the ward, each individually. Now, they weren't uh, selected because they were a quartet of instruments that fit each other. They just were great instruments on their own. 1933, 1934, she realized that she had a valuable instrument, musical instrument on her hands, 
but she can't get a quartet going. At the time, Mrs. Coolidge in Washington, D.C. had that Coolidge Auditorium built, and all of the famous quartet from around the world used to come and play there. The result is that she demanded the library if they would accept the violin. The most famous quartet in the world those days was named the Budapest Quartet. The Budapest Quartet, on tour in the United States, was invited to play the Whithall Quartet at the Coolidge Auditor. They had such a great success that Mrs. Whithall demanded them to become the artist in residence. At the times they were paid $5,000 a year, $20,000 for the quart. She demanded very strict rehearsal, very hard work and all, but the quartet accepted. They remained the quartet for 22 years. who was the first violinist of the Budapest, generally tended to play the bets, which is a very noble instrument. It's actually an instrument that you have to let play itself. You cannot shape the bets. It's a, it has a personality in which you're at your best if you allow the bets to be at its best in its own way. Uh, the castle bark, I played the bets also. Roisman played the bets almost all the time in his residence with the Budapest. I started with the bets and played it for many, many years. Uh, now I play the Kasselbark violin, which I understand Heifetz preferred too. He came, you know, these instruments, by the way, uh, are theoretically available to any interested person who's qualified to play, to come to the library and say, if somebody recommends it, you just can't come off the street and say, I play a violin and I want to play the Strad. But a person who comes with the proper credentials can pick up the instruments and play them. in my hands an extraordinary violin, which of course I don't play usually. We can play these fantastic instruments here at the Library of Congress. It's a magnificent Stradivarius, the Betts. First time I, I meet the Stradivarius, and it's an incredible emotion to play this violin. It's far beyond all that one could expect. Yeah, I'm madly in love with this instrument, actually. It's just, inc it's really incredible.
The violin started by the middle of the 16th century. Uh, viola was starting in Brescia, and the violin was starting in Cremona. And uh, at the time, let's say by 1560, which is the first label we know, it was signed by Andrea Amati, which is probably the founder of the Cremoni school, where the, all the great famous instruments come from. From the shop of Amati comes a young artist by the name of Antonio Stradivarius, pupil of Nicola Amati. This became, and still is, the number one violin maker into the world today. One of the reasons is that he somehow changed the baroque design of the violin to give it more what a violin is today. And everyone is to, who makes instruments always try to make a Strad model. Today is the universal model for everyone. They are very temperamental. A great instrument is not a passive object. It is an instrument that has certain tendencies. It, you have to, in a sense, treat it the way you treat a very loved person. I mean, they, if you treat it badly, it begins to respond badly. And also, the instruments need an enormous amount of care in terms of being in good condition. So it took us, I would say, two or three years before we could play them with such understanding and feeling and, and comfort that we could enjoy them the way uh, a person would say, oh, you're playing on a quartet of strads. It takes time. It's not a simple uh, process. <laughs> I had played the bets for many, many years, but it was at a certain point where Mr. Morley, the luthier who took care of the instruments, became not quite so able to make trips on the spot up to the library to keep the instrument in good uh, condition or in uh, good, uh, uh, you might say, adjustment. That's the word we use. Uh, I began to have trouble with the instrument speaking, especially on the E string. It would make lots of squeaks. You know, I'd be playing a passage and all of a sudden the note wouldn't speak or the tone was not quite right. And it began to affect me actually in terms of um, my playing in tune a little bit in passages. And there was a particularly sticky critic, music critic, for one of the Washington papers. There was a whole a series of uh, concerts where he began to criticize me. Finally, one day, I went to, it was still, uh, well, no, I guess it might have been Ed Waters at that time. I can't remember the exact time of the library uh, when this was happening. And I said, you know, I'm having such trouble playing the, the Betts Stradivarius. Uh, would you mind for the next couple of concerts if I played the, um, Del Jesu Guarnerius of Fritz Chrysler's that's at the Library of Congress. And he was sensitive to the fact that I'd been attacked in the press quite a bit. And so he said, OK. Now, there's an interesting thing about the Guarneri. All the violinists of the world who know about that instrument say it's one of the greatest instruments in the whole world. Public didn't know I wasn't playing the Betts Strat. In the meantime, uh, the major critic of that paper Irving Lawrence came to the concert to review it. And he wrote a review afterwards which said, uh, one of my critics on my staff had been very critical of Robert Mann's playing recently. And I know his playing, and I know it's not uh, the way it was being described. And I went to see what was going on. And uh, I immediately was aware that he was playing the Chrysler del Jesu Guarnerius. Now, the library people feel that he was tipped off by somebody in the library, so he knew it. But he said, and Mr. Mann sounded as wonderful as he usually sounds. So obviously, it was a sick Stradivarius. Of course, the library was very upset at that. They shouldn't have been. Then, at a certain point, 
we recommended that the wonderful um, repairman and luthier, René Morel, who works in New York City and who adjusts our instrument all the time, be brought down to do some very long needed uh, repairs, such as putting in new bass bars. The beauty of the instruments is not just how they sound, but it's how they play for the player. Um, a great old Italian instrument like the Stradivarius or the, the Del Gesù, and the Del Gesù violin, the Guarnerius Del Gesù violin, the Fritz Chrysler violin in the collection of the library, is, is probably the greatest instrument in this collection. These Stradivarius instruments are magnificent, and the, but somehow the Guarnerius, maybe it's just the emotional attachment of Fritz Chrysler when you think that the Chrysler played this instrument, but um, that's probably the most extraordinary instrument in the collection. Um, these instruments are so easy to play. walking into the locked area of the stacks, of the music division stacks. And this is the area of the stacks that includes our special collections. I'm taking you to the, one of the treasures of the Library of Congress, which is the Whittall Collection. And uh, if you look along the wall here, this uh, case of shelves of books, you'll see J.S. Bach, Johannes Brahms, Mozart, Beethoven, Haydn, Arnold Schoenberg, Franz Schubert. These are all boxes that contain autograph scores. The, that means this, uh, manuscripts in the hand of the composers. And these were all purchased by Mrs. Whittall and by her foundation. These are all master works of the European musical scene. Um, I think that was probably because her taste was relatively conservative, but it was also important for the American people in their national library to have examples of these works which are among the finest in the art music tradition. And uh, probably a little peculiar about the, about the collection is the Schoenberg manuscripts, but when Arnold Schoenberg fled from Europe and came to the United States, he had a hard time making a living. And uh, apparently, uh, it may be apocryphal, but apparently Mrs. Whittall was particularly fond of his uh, piece for Claire to Nacht, which is an early Schoenberg piece, and because of that, was willing to be convinced to purchase uh, autographs of uh, his string quartets and Piero Luner and various other works. And with these purchases, the Library of Congress helped to keep one of the major composers of the 20th century alive. Also in this collection is the is a Bach autograph that is a autograph of cantata number 10, which is in his own hand. And uh, we'll take it out and uh, take a look at it. It's in a big, huge box that's been prepared by the restoration people at the Library of Congress. It's really quite a beautiful job, an example not only of uh, their work, but it has now enabled a lot of people who visit the library to be able to see the original before it was preserved, we could only serve it on microfilm, and we still do prefer to serve it on microfilm. But um, you can see that each of the pages has been put into a plastic encapsulation, and it's been the pages have been deacidified, and the cover is vellum. And it, you notice that there are no clasps, uh, no metal clasps or anything. And that means that in this weather in Washington, even though this is supposed to be uh, humidity controlled here, still this can expand and contract without hurting the pages because the vellum expands and contracts. And these clasps expand and contract. And it's really quite a lovely, thoughtful job on the part of the people who restored it. And then inside, you actually have J.S. Bach's own handwriting. And you can see it wasn't too neat. This was hurriedly done. 
And one of the things that's wonderful about having an original autograph, especially a treasure like this, is you can actually see how the composer changed his mind. There are several places in here where he's changed the notes. And for people who are studying Bach, that's uh, an indication of the process that he used for composition, the process of thought that he went through in his mind when you see those changes. The Stradivarius is, in some ways, a symbol of the tradition of Western art music. So it's a combination of the great instruments and the music that was written by Haydn, by Mozart, by Beethoven, and later in the 19th century by composers such as Brahms, who represented this great tradition. It was their music that really uh, established the Stradivarius and the Guarnerius and other great Cremonese instruments as really symbolic of this tradition. Mendelssohn was in fact 16 when he wrote this masterpiece. It is possibly the uh, greatest work of a child prodigy that we have in Western music. This is the scherzo of Mendelssohn's Octet for Strings, Opus 20. He was 16 years old when he wrote this piece, and it is remarkable that when he published it uh, at the age of 21, this is the one movement in which he made no substantial change at all. It's an absolutely wonderful example of this genre for which Mendelssohn, of course, was famous. This is Mozart's Quintet for Strings, Kirschel 515. It's certainly one of the great uh, works for strings by Mozart or by any composer for that matter. It's m among the treasures that Mrs. Whittall gave to the Library of Congress. This actually is one of the neater manuscripts of Beethoven that we have in the Whittall collection. It's his romance, Opus 50, for violin and orchestra. Beethoven was notorious for the uh, apparent passion and uh, messiness evident in his manuscripts. early every season and they have to get adjusted to the instruments and the instruments have to be adjusted to the performers. It's a very interesting uh, procedure because we have our luthier, Rene Morel from New York, who comes at the beginning of each year, adjusting each instrument for the performer, making very critical adjustments. Uh, and these then become their instruments for the year. Now, the interesting thing about Stradivarius is that it doesn't seem under the ear to have power, the great Stradivarius instruments. But what they have is a la laser-like concentration of sound that cuts through the distance so that even in the end of the hall it sounds, you hear it, you see, you can hear what people do with the instrument. Now, in the Library of Congress, of course, you play in an ideal acoustical situation. It's a hall that only holds some 500 people and it has some of the most beautiful acoustics of the whole world for chamber music. Stradivarius at the beginning were so loud that they were not even recognized. It has been said somewhere in a book, Mozart, I believe, writing to his son, he says, if you're gonna buy a violin, buy yourself a good sounding Steiner or an Amati, but keep away from those Stradivarius who are so strident and screaming. Therefore, you can see around the end of, the, uh, of that century, the beginning of the 18th century, there's already a change, a demand for a change in the sound. What do you think? I think it's very good. It 
just need slightly bit more ringing. I think so. I yeah. think it's still a little bit mm -hmm. tight. I would like to be a little more flexible yeah. if it's possible. You know? yeah. Especially the G-string, I feel that it's a little bit tight. Where did you uh, come from? I just ah. came from Houston. Uh -huh. So it was quite humid, and I think the, all the change of the you know, humidity and the temperature. That's probably, probably what does it. Well, you know, okay. it's, I blame the fiddle, not myself. So. <laughs> Okay, we make you smile, big. Eh? No, but so are you going to loosen it? Or? I'm going to make it slightly rounder. <sighs> yeah. We play the same thing. Much more cushion too. Yeah, the G has more. Yeah. again the yeah. most. Yeah, I think so. Wow. I think this is much better. More yeah. Cushion. Well, you, okay. Try a little spiccato on this. Find out. For the Perfect. It's all my fault from now on, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> this is exactly where I'm yeah. coming to see Rene whenever I'm through touring. And you know, especially these days, you know, with all the flying, you, you know, I was in Houston where it was 96 degrees with humidity of, you know, 100%. Then I come back to New York where it's 65 degrees and humidity of 40%. And because of its wood, and old wood at that, it absorbs all the humidity and, you know, it's very sensitive. So I, you know, come back whenever I have, you know, Europe or wherever, I come back and make sure that he looks through the instrument, every corner of it, make sure it's not open and all that. I had this violin now for about five and a half, six years. And I think I'm just now beginning to really know the instrument. A violinist of a great talent, he doesn't play the instrument, he make it sing. It's very important because of the nature of these instruments for to have an important performing career, eventually you need a great instrument. It just, it just has to be that way. At a certain point um, in, in your growth artistically and also in your impression to the public, a great instrument just has more potential. Every musician, when they play, they're doing something extremely difficult. It's to be a soloistic, virtuoso violin player. It's something really on the edge of human ability, the same way that athletes who are playing in the Olympics are, are pushing the records. I remember when I was a student of violin making out in Salt Lake City, one of the first times I actually got to see a really great Strad. There was a visiting violinist who brought the uh, De Chepenet Strad through, which is uh, one of the, it's a little, it's late golden period, it's one of the most magnificent violins that, that I know. And um, he was really generous enough to stop by the school and we all went upstairs to, the, to a, this classroom and we sat down and passed the Strad from hand to hand and all these violin makers were just like, oh my God, a Strad. It's like, Everyone's looking over your shoulder and you're trying to get your 30 seconds to look at it and try to remember what it looks like and then it would go to the next student and it went from hand to hand. And, and then afterwards, uh, this violinist played the Bach Chacon on the violin in, this, in a room, you know, a reasonable sized room and just the power of that sound. I mean, it's something I really remember to this day. Other people, a friend of mine who's also a violin maker was there at that time and we both remember that as one of those moments when we knew, you know, we're really doing something. And this sound that just came out of that violin, you know, just being just a, a few feet away from it, just a circle of students standing there. And that's something I've never forgotten. And uh, 
it's really been kind of a thrill to me now. Uh, years later, I actually had that same violinist in my shop and uh, who played the same piece on a violin of mine. And it just, uh, he's actually has given up his Strad in the meantime, or he's just giving it up and uh, he borrowed a violin of mine to play his concerts on for a summer. And uh, it's very interesting because this guy had supposedly one of the great Strads. And um, he was a little dissatisfied with the, with the response that he was getting. It was, it was great when it was great, but it was finicky. Sometimes it would be a little out of adjustment. He just couldn't get enough power out of the G string or it wouldn't respond quite right. And he was suffering. He was constantly running to New York to get it adjusted. And uh, he finally decided to give it up. And uh, I remember when he took out my violin for the summer to play his concerts, he was really scared that he was going to go on stage and people were going to say, hey, that's not a Strad, and uh, he doesn't sound as good anymore. And he felt very insecure to go on stage with a new violin. It was a copy of a Guarneri that he took out. And uh, so it, you couldn't tell that it wasn't an old violin. And he didn't tell anyone that he wasn't playing an old violin. And people came up to him after the concert and said, you know, your Strad sounds much better since you had it worked on. It's really much more powerful. And I think we both considered the experiment very successful. This is one of his copies of the Stradivarius. And it looks darn close, even though this was made, what, in 86, I think? And it's really my fondest hope that our modern makers are going to come through for us. This is darn good. And uh, frankly, I'd, I'd rather have one of these than what you can get for you know, really a lot of money. There are strads which I, am, I just revere and Guarneri's which I've studied for hours. However, though most of the violins that are around that bear those names are not nearly so fine. Uh, they're heavily repaired. They've been altered. You can see the footprints of every restorer who's walked through them and the sweat marks of every violinist who's played them. And sometimes there's really very little left of them except uh, the patina and the name and the price. The old instruments are getting way out of sight, being able to acquire it. I mean, when, when I got my Strad, see, my Strad has, the scroll of mine is not original. There's a rib that's fake. It's been patched to death underneath the top. It's got no original varnish left on the top, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's worth about half what it, what it would have been otherwise. And my uh, little old lady giving me a huge amount of money, my parents giving my inheritance in advance, my Aunt Lil you know, giving me half her life savings, selling my other violin, et cetera, et cetera. I managed to barely acquire this other thing, which is not, not really a desirable collector's piece. And that now, my instrument is nearly tripled in value. Some people wonder why make a violin, that, a new violin that looks old. And for me, there's, a, there's several reasons for it. One is that it's actually a time-honored study technique to take an old master painting, whatever, and copy it down to the, fine, to the smallest detail. Because when you, when you force yourself into the discipline of copying something completely, even the little idiosyncrasies that you might not understand, it forces your hand into that path. There's things that maybe you don't really understand why they're important or not. And if you're not educated enough and you haven't had enough experience, then it's hard to say, well, this is an important detail. This detail, I don't, I don't think it's important. I just won't do it. But when you, when you really follow the discipline of following that master, you have to follow every nuance. And I feel like I'm doing that enough times. I've, um, I don't even need to look at the, the, my model anymore, practically. When I just work, my hand follows those paths. Uh, my eye wants to see that, because I, I really have tried to get it inside of me, what, what Guarneri, what Strad were trying to do, what they saw, and try to see it the same way. There's Strads, and there's Strads, and there's great instruments. And you know, my Strad is a, is a lovely 1702 violin. And but what I'd really rather play on 
is a great Guarneria del Jesu, which actually now are more valuable than Stradivarius, generally speaking. And my favorite violin I've ever touched happens to be the, the great Chrysler del Jesu at the Library of Congress, which I actually played in a concert once. Because when you, when you go there as a musician, they sometimes will let you give them give it a try, which is nice for us. And I must say, that's, that, that may be the single greatest player's instrument I've ever experienced in my life. And next, next to Strad's, the Guarneri's have more power. They like have an extra gear. You want to go louder to a certain point, then you want to give a little more. You just, Guarneri's have this extra push, which you can get out of it. The Nile's refined and lovely, but they're, but they're more sort of uh, bold and uh, robust sounding. Anyhow, Sam Zygmuntovich has copied the Chrysler del Jesu. And this is it. And anyone who knows anything on fiddles, will, hearts will leap when they first take a, a quick look at this thing. It really looks just about exactly like it, even down to the wear patterns. It's pretty amazing. And I think he's captured quite a bit of the characteristics of it. In terms of the power, that extra gear, this has got it. And it's got quite a bit of the beauty, too, I must say. You feel like a band when you play this violin. When you take an instrument which is completely destroyed and no one wants to touch it anymore because it's gone, this is my cup of tea. This is where I love to put back that instrument alive again. And that I did that few times with instruments which were completely ignored by many older shop around the world. They knew there was those pieces there, but no one dared to put them together, which I did. So this is somewhat a reward. Now, when these people come to me and play that instrument, that's really a great satisfaction to me. This instrument uh, was repaired before and so-called restored, but it had a crack all along the back, had a crack in each corner, had a very bad crack this way, which is, and on top of that, somebody thought that to make it sound good, they had to remove the wood. So they, they removed so much wood that it was way too thin for sound projection. So that's what you see here. This is called a stomach patch. Actually, it's much larger because there was an accident here where there's a crack coming right across the instrument which needed to be reinforced. So we have the instrument being thin, it was advisable to make the patch a little larger. Due to the wear and of the instrument by being played for so many years, the edge here was completely worn down. All the way to the, not even the purfling was gone. So this is what you see, it's what is called a edge and underlay, which is grafted in one piece, not joined, up here. So therefore, the moisture from the neck, same thing at the shoulder, one piece graft, will not separate that. In our own time, I think we've seen a real renaissance in violin making, and violin makers who are now active, are, I think, are some of the, some of really the best that we've seen in a long time. Still sharp, 
with the LAs, you need to. You want me to hit it again? It's a little bit, yeah. Okay. Sharp. See, otherwise, when he plays, it's going to help his finger. Yeah. 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 Sharp. All right, we'll knock it down. Okay. My teachers have, for the most part, been European immigrants. Uh, Peter Preer, who was my violin-making teacher, is a German who studied in Mittenwald. And uh, René Morel is from France. He came here in the 50s. Uh, in other circumstances, they would have still been there. But as it's turned out, um, some of the finest craftsmen of this generation and the last generation came to this country. And uh, some of the finest instruments also came here. So there's been a real high point of violin restoration and violin connoisseurship and violin making here now. One of the ways that I've really tried to get close to the old masters is to um, study them extremely closely. I've done years of restoration with strads. I've had them in pieces. I had a strad in pieces in my workshop here. And um, I've measured every millimeter every corner and photographed it upside down and drawn it and after doing that long enough I feel like I've made those masters my teacher rather than the teacher I had in Salt Lake or the other teachers I've had. They've been very good in giving me my technique but uh, I'm really trying to reach back in time to those masters uh, and I feel very close to them in a way. I don't know what they looked like or what they sounded like but uh, I feel I've, I've spent so much time with them that I have a real feeling for, for what they were doing, their aesthetic. You just put a little glue on the inside and you tap it for them. That's it. You, you slide a, a spatula yeah. and you put a piece of paper. You don't even have to put a paper. You get the paper yes. already. Yes. So you put the glue for I produce already quite a number of very famous young artists oh, you in restoration. and. Uh, to my disappointment is that if they go and make new instruments and some restoration, when you see the craftsmanship 10 years later, you realize that the restoration is not at the level that they were doing when they were with me. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Strad didn't stand alone. He wasn't just this giant who rose out of nowhere. Um, he was a part of his time. He was a, he was a student of a great teacher. And uh, that teacher, Amati, had other students as well, you know, Andre Guarneri, uh, a variety of other Prevenese makers. By the time Strad was at the height of his career, he was considered one of the masters of his time. And a lot of makers were working in his shadow. Uh, but as time's gone, time has gone by, many of those makers who were in his shadow have really come to the forefront. Uh, Guarneri, Guarneri del Gesu, uh, that's his nickname, his real name was uh, Joseph Guarneri. Uh, has now, in his, own, in his own lifetime, he was probably very poorly considered. He didn't all the time have the best materials. His work was a little bit sloppy, a little bit rushed looking compared to Strad. And when you see his instruments, they're very frequently quite worn because you can see that this is an instrument that a working musician bought and just played to death and just loved to death. Uh, whereas Strad's, you still have some that were sold to, to royal courts, which were made on patronage out of the most splendid materials imaginable and then kept in a collection, kept in a convent. But what happened with Stradivarius, I believe, is that he had some sort of a genius in himself. Not the most educated person, because all of the letters that he has written, and which are in the archives in the Museum of Cremona, is making a mistake, a grammatical error, in almost every other word, which doesn't remove the fact that that man was a genius his intelligence and common sense probably made more than all the education he could have get. If we think in their days, where could he get a better education about violin than with Amati? I feel like that my real competition is not other violin makers, although there's many good ones, but I really feel like I'm competing against Strad, Guarneri, and Amati because they've, um, they've dominated the field. When someone thinks of a great violin, that's what goes to their mind. And uh, I didn't become a violin maker so I could make pretty good second-rate violins if you can't afford a Strad. I was really trying to emulate what I considered to be the finest examples, the finest examples of the finest makers. 
and uh, that's something I've really pursued and devoted myself to. So I, I have really great hope for makers like Sam that they're going to they're going to make an instrument we really would rather use. I'm happy to sell my Strad, pay my mortgage, <sighs> and use something by you know a modern craftsman that I, that I really can believe in. But I have a Strad in my closet. I can say that those are those less fortunate to have one. Um, like students coming out of Juilliard now who would like to kill me for mine. Stradivarius speaks for itself. There is a variety and number of instruments which are difficult to know what they are. But the Stradivarius, it speaks for itself. It's the same that when you open a book, you know if you can, if it's a language you can read or not. The Strad, you don't mistake on the Strad. Of course, the real challenge at some point is to leave behind Strad and Guarneri. I mean, they're dead. They had their time, and they, they set the stage for us. And to, before you can try to surpass them or leave them behind, you have to come up to their level. And um, that's something I've been striving to do for a long time. My greatest hope about the Stradivarius is, first of all, the one distinction that ancient instruments have over other art objects is that they're still functional. Now, it's true, a painting can still reach you and communicate with you, but they're mostly in private collections or in museums. Uh, a Stradivarius can be played to an ongoing audience over the years. <laughs> problem, of course, is that inflation eats up all these endowments. And my main hope, because of course the Juilliard will be in, you know, not the last quartet in residence at the Library of Congress, my great hope is that they will be able to overcome the economic pressure and continue to give the concerts at the library. Uh, it's been, I would say, very meaningful to the Juilliard Quartet over the years to play these instruments and to be the resident quartet at the Library of Congress. I and mean, we sacrifice a lot of other things on the outside because this is more meaningful to us. And I know that there are many other young quartets who would love to be in the same position. Thank you. 